Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com and it's episode number 253 of Goulet Q&A here in the middle of May. This is magical time in between my and Rachel's birthday. Actually, as this is publishing today, this is Rachel's birthday. Happy birthday, dear. Um, but uh, as I'm recording this, it's this magical 17 day window in between me and Rachel's birthday where I get to make fun of her for being so young and naive and inexperienced and she gets to call me an old fart who's out of touch and <laughs> it's fun. I'm 17 days older than her. But anyway, uh, let's see here. In this episode, I'm gonna talk about Yurushi Pen Care, pens that are easy to clean and nib smoothness. So it should be pretty good. I got seven questions for you here today. A little bit fewer than last week, but I'm still excited about it. Her last two weeks ago, because I was off last week. I'm all confused. Anyway, last week I was off because we were at Disney World. So that was very exciting. The kids had an absolute blast. It's the most magical place on earth, right? Um, but it was a lot of fun. We've been, we've been before, uh, both with our kids and without. It's a definitely a different experience either way. Um, but our kids are old enough now, they're seven and nine, where they had a really good time and they had no strollers or anything, no naps. They were like full on doing it. So I uh, had a good time, walked like five to seven miles a day, ate a ton of food, rode a ton of things, and it worked out pretty great. So nice time of year to go because it's not too crowded, not too hot, but hot enough to do the um, water parks, which they absolutely loved. So it has been a bunch of stuff going on here while we've been gone, it's launching some new things, talking about some new products. Uh, one of them that came out was Retro 51 rollerball pen that's what they call their popper so this is something not exclusive to us but something that came out with everything I, we may still have a few of these left um, but they're not going to be around much longer so it's called stan it is a hockey themed very clever name for stanley cup no <laughs> without having the trademark uh, infringement or anything um, very cool theming it's kind of a clear demonstrator with like a cracked ice kind of thing going on. Uh, I'm not personally a, a, a huge hockey fan or anything, but if you are, um, this is really cool. And it's the first demonstrator that I have seen of retro. So I kept one for myself because I'm pretty much a retro collector de facto now. Um, and then the, the topper is really cool too. It's got a hockey mask. I don't even know if I can show that to you, but there you go. Pretty cool. So um, it's neat. So that's cool. Pick one of those up if you haven't already. We may have a few of them left. And then some other cool things that we've had that have come out recently. Um, Opus 88 has expanded some of their nibs to include extra fines. So that's cool. Um, we did a right now on Wednesday, Rachel and I did, on some new paper products that we have. The Quavatis Habana has now gone back to its 90 gram white Clairefontaine paper, which they had like 10 years ago when we first started carrying the brand. They switched shortly after that to the 85 gram off-white, which we have since discontinued, but they changed the paper and gone back to the 90 gram white, which is pretty cool because you can't get a pure white paper that's fountain pen friendly in very many notebooks. So we're excited about this one. Uh, we also have another paper product called Endless Notebooks, which is Tomoe River paper in a bound journal, uh, which we haven't really seen before. Endless is a new brand, and so we're excited to get them out there and uh, have you all try some of them. And then we also have a um, new uh, life, uh, what is it called? I can never remember the name of it. I swear, I'm just terrible at remembering things, but uh, it's a new Quovatis planner that I'm gonna look it up right now because we just shot a video on it <laughs> this morning. Uh, and I still can't remember the name of it. Life Journal, Infinite Notebook. There you go. Life Journal, Infinite Notebook. You get Endless, you get Infinite. I'm just like, you know, Infinite Black or something like that is the name of the Endless. I, I get them all confused. But anyway, that's where we're at. So uh, you can check that one out. It's cool for a bullet journal format if you don't want to start from scratch and do your own kind of like fancy calligraphy type writing or the hand lettering, I guess I should say. Um, it's kind of already there for you in a format that you can more pick it up and go and do the bullet journal thing. So that's pretty cool. And it also has the Clairefontaine 90 gram white paper. So you can check out all those notebooks. We've got all those now. Uh, we have some new pens from Monte Grappa, the moon landing pens. We shot it right now on Monday with Drew on those, the crazy limited edition one and then the regular edition two, which is also very cool. So we've got those, um, Stipula Toco Ferro. We've now expanded to purple and clear. They've done a couple other colors like a red and a yellow, which we don't have, but they're out there if you're curious. Um, but we'll have the purple and clear for a while. And then the there's only 351 of each of those colors, by the way. 
Um, so that's how it's uh, that's how it's been. Three fifty one is like the magic number for stipula on those ones. Um, and then Visconti has expanded their Medici to a couple new colors, so you may want to check those out. And then we've had some sales on some Monteverde pens, like the Giant Sequoias. Excuse me, Giant Sequoias, some uh, Conklin pens and things like that. They're not like lasting forever kind of thing, but um, you know we were able to give you a good deal on those. Uh, I think because they're going to look to change over some of the colors, so they're looking to clear out some of their old colors. So it's kind of like a, I mean, it's not really a closeout because they're not changing out the model. That's sort of a closeout, I guess, of those colors, but it's more like a clearance, sort of like if you, you know, are changing seasons on a, you know, a clothing rack or something. You have a clearance of the old stuff, bring in the new stuff. Uh, so that's why some of that stuff's happening. All right, let's get into the questions for this week, shall we? Uh, pen and writing questions, starting it off with Breedford on Instagram. Hello, just got my first Yurushi pen. Congratulations. The Pilot 100th Anniversary Fuji and Meiji Maru, which is what this is. Uh, got it yesterday. Absolutely thrilled. I've read about avoiding ultraviolet to prevent color change, but do they require any additional special care? Specifically talking about Yurushi pens. Uh, maintain a certain humidity, special cleaning procedure, certain material for a pen case or a pouch. Thank you in advance. Sure. I mean, yeah, obviously when you're spending this much money on a pen, you know, this pen's in the $1,400 range. Yurushi pens can go way up from there even, but you can get some that are more in the $700 range even. Um, but uh, still, it's an expensive process because basically the labor that's involved and uh, the Yurushi itself is not super cheap either. Um, but Yurushi is a lacquer. So it's a, um, you know, when you say Yurushi pens, you tend to think of a particular style of pen or maybe even a brand, but it's really, it has to do with the finish, the material that the pen is coated with. That is Yurushi lacquer. So it comes from very specific trees, uh, mainly from Japan, some in China. Uh, but that's pretty much what you're working with. And it's a hundreds and hundreds, I think it's like a 12 or 1500 year old process um, that really like Japan has been really famous for and they've kind of perfected it. So Pilot, obviously you see a lot of it. You see some of it in Platinum too. Um, and there's other brands that will, you know, you know, Pelican will come out with, you know, Rod and Yurushi stuff every now and then. Of course, Sailor has a bunch, Nakaya. Um, so a lot of the Japanese brands, you're gonna see more of these. Um, but, uh, you know, specifically talking about this pilot one, this was obviously a very special one because it was their 100th anniversary celebrating, um, you know, kind of the, the, the historical founding of pilot. So um, the founder of pilot, Namiki, um, Ryosuke Namiki was um, uh, a ship captain. So that's why pilot, that's where it got the name from, is piloting a ship. They have a lot of ship themes. Mount Fuji, the ship, there's a lot of theming in there uh, around that, especially with the 100th anniversary stuff. So um, this specific pen that you have here, Breedford, uh, is actually a brass bodied pen. So it's got a little bit of weight to it. So um, as far as things like humidity and, and um, you know, temperature variation, stuff like that, you aren't necessarily going to have to deal with quite as much of that um, as you would with like an ebonite body or maybe some other natural material body pen. So basically what happens, you have your Rushi, it's this lacquer coating, it takes, you can have up to like 40 or, or more coats of lacquer on some of the really elaborate ones because you build it up in layers um, and then you, there's all kinds of techniques for making it look different ways. Um, so what happens is when you have uh, ultraviolet rays, of course the ultraviolet itself with either sunlight or halogen or something like that, can actually discolor the lacquer. So that's why you don't want to have it stored out in direct sunlight all the time. Of course, they're beautiful pens, so you want to be looking at them, but you know, don't have them right next to the window or something, have them put away a little bit. Um, but if you're not using them or you know, displaying them or something like that, um, it's best to keep them stored away in the dark. Uh, so that's one thing is the UV is not great for it. Um, but humidity can be a factor. It's more so if you have a really, really, really dry environment. That's not particularly great for it, more so because whatever the natural substrate is, like ebonite, which is a hard rubber, um, that can shrink uh, because it's hygroscopic. So it can shrink and swell based on how much moisture there is. Uh, and if you have something like that, either it's wood or ebonite or something like that, um, that, that movement due to humidity changes can actually cause cracking or uh, you know, other issues that can come through on the ebonite, so, uh, or come through on the Yurushi. So that's not particularly 
uh, awesome, crazing, that was the other word I was looking at. So crazing is kind of what it looks like a, a webbed kind of, um, you know, crackling, uh, as opposed to just like a split or a crack. Um, I haven't actually heard of this happening a lot. Yurushi is an extremely durable material. That's part of why it's so appealing. And you can see centuries old Yurushi dishware and other boxes and pens and things like that uh, that are in perfect condition. So they can, they can last a really, really long time with some kind of basic care. So keeping it out of direct sunlight is ideal. Um, you know, not, there's no specific like has to, it's not like a humidor with cigars where it like has to be maintained at 68% humidity or something like that. I don't know if that's what cigars are. I just threw 68 there as a number. Um, but it's the kind of thing you just don't want to keep in a super dry environment or you don't want to change it drastically with temperature or humidity um, because mainly of the substrate of the pen can shrink or swell too drastically and that could impact the uh, finish of the Urushi. So keep that in mind. Um, no extreme heat or cold temperature and changes. Yeah, so no extreme heat or cold exposure in general, but then trying to avoid very quick, very drastic temperature or, or fluctuations like that. Um, you know, basically when you're cleaning it, treat it like you would cellulite, celluloid, ebonite, or some other natural material like that. You know, you don't want to use any abrasives. You don't want to use any harsh chemicals on it. You know, it can withstand things like alcohol and stuff like that, but I wouldn't go that route. I don't think it's necessary to clean it with anything like that. Really just wiping it with a clean cloth. Like if you have a microfiber cloth, like this are kind of ideal. Maybe not this bright because it'll make your eyes bleed, but I like bright ones because I lose them all the time and it's easy to see. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that's just me. So just wiping it like that, that'll get off your fingerprints. That'll get off even just some regular grime and stuff that like that might, might get on there. Um, but if you need to, you know, wetting it and getting a little bit of dish soap, dish detergent should pretty much get anything off that you would expose it to on, on a daily basis. Uh, and that should be in pretty good shape. Um, you can use a terry cloth towel too if you don't want to use a microfiber or you don't have one, that's fine. Um, so you don't want to soak it in anything. Um, that's not particularly great for it. So, you know, a typical pen you may be inclined to, you know, if it's got like ink all inside the cap and all that, you may just drop it in a cup of water and let it soak. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Uh, you know, you can, you can clean out the inside of it and stuff like that, that's fine, but don't just leave it sitting in moisture for a very long time again because you don't want shrinking and swelling to impact the, the finish. Uh, let's see here, what else? Um, yeah, no excessive heat or dry environments. Da, 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 da. Uh, oh, in terms of like a pen case or a pouch or something like that. Again, it really comes down to just abrasives. You know, you don't want it to be where you know, whatever pen thing that you're storing it in, you don't want it like clanking into other things. It's, it's a really durable material. Like if you have, you know, something like a Pilot Vanishing Point, for example, that's gonna have like more of a lacquer finish on it, um, that's not Yurushi, that actually is, is less durable of a finish than, these, than this type of Yurushi lacquer is. Um, so you really don't have to handle it with kid gloves necessarily, other than the fact that it's really expensive and you probably will wanna just take care of it. Um, but it actually is, is pretty darn durable. So um, just making sure that it's not like smashing into other pens, that it doesn't have anything crazy. I mean, I can't think of any pen scenario that you would be willing to place this in that you wouldn't wanna place or that you would, or that you wouldn't want to place any other pen in. Um, so there's nothing really special to be considered. It's not like, you know, certain types of leather cases or anything will mess it up uh, that I'm aware of anyway. So um, just mention just anything with like a soft interior, you know, certainly something like the rickshaws with their felt interior is really nice. Um, you know, but most things, even just leather that has like the natural kind of suede on the inside, or if it has any type of liner or velvet or anything like that, um, that would be perfectly fine for something like this. So that is certainly uh, gonna do you justice there. Um, and then, you know, obviously if you have something like that's just plain Yurushi, you don't really have to, um, you know, uh, take as much into consideration. If you have anything that has uh, natural materials in it, like rotten or like a quail egg shell or something like that, it's gonna have your Rushi lacquer coated over top of it, but even still, when you have even more natural materials in it, uh, you just wanna be maybe a little extra careful in terms of how you handle it and the types of um, you know, chemicals and stuff that you would expose it to, uh, you know, just so that you're not uh, causing any, any potential damage to your very, very nice and expensive pens. 
Um, but yeah, I just say enjoy the heck out of it. Um, use it. Uh, I don't want you to be afraid to take your really nice, expensive artistic pen <clears throat> and carry it around and write with it and use it on a regular basis. You know, a lot of the people that I know that really love these pens, it's not only because they look beautiful, but it's because they're great writers too. Um, so be, be proud to carry it around and use it. Um, and I know specifically from talking to people at Pilot, um, they say the artists who create these pens, nothing makes them happier than knowing that the whoever is buying these pens is actually carrying them around and using them and writing with them and enjoying them as they were created. You know, uh, that, that brings them a lot of joy. So you're actually making the artisans very happy and fulfilled by using them uh, as writing instruments. So hope you enjoy it and I hope this was uh, helpful for you. Uh, from Chartman Designs on Instagram, I'd love to purchase another fountain pen but I'm concerned about the amount of cleaning and upkeep they take. Is there a fountain pen out there that takes minimal upkeep and cleaning? Okay, so which fountain pens are easy to clean? I've kind of touched on this on various uh, Q&As and stuff before. Um, my favorite cleaning uh, type of pen that's out there is, is just your straight up cartridge converter pen um, because you can use a bulb syringe. You know, this little, this little thing, it's like a boogie sucker that you get at the hospital when your kid's born. You can, they're called sometimes called an ear and ulcer syringe. Not as catchy, so we call it a bulb syringe here at Goulet, but that's essentially what it is. It's a two ounce bulb that can hold a ton of water. Two ounces is a lot of water. That's more than your typical ink bottle can hold. Uh, and then you take your pen. Lamy's are a great pen for this because you can, you know, this is still new. Let me take the little thing off. There we go. So if you're using your pen, you literally just fill this thing with water, shove it in the back here, press on it, water pushes all the way through so it's all clean water up here it's all pushing through as opposed to a converter where you're you're sucking it up and then pushing it out and sucking it up and pushing it out you know if you're using a cartridge you can obviously just pop this off clean it and pop on a new cartridge or if you're using a converter what i like to do is i just you know flush this thing out put a paper towel to it suck up all that extra water and you're pretty much good to go uh, and then with the converter i just suck a little bit of water up into that shake it and dump the converter itself. So I actually clean the converter separately from the pens on pretty much all the cartridge converter pens that I have. Um, but anyway, so that's, you know, that's a very similar process to pretty much all cartridge converter pens. You can use the bulb syringe and this bulb syringe has been like the single greatest, um, you know, discovery in my fountain pen life experience in terms of the amount of enjoyment I get for the investment involved. Um, saves me a ton of time, makes cleaning a little more fun and interesting, and, uh, and it's, it's something I highly, highly recommend as you're getting into your fountain pen journey here. I'm just assuming you're kind of new into the process. Maybe you've gotten your first pen and you want to expand. That's totally cool. Hopefully you already have a cartridge converter and you can just get that and already improve your experience. Um, certain brands, you know, Pilot being one of them, Schaefer, Sailor, some of their pens, uh, don't have the same configuration on the back. Um, they have a little post on the inside here and the bulb syringe doesn't fit in there quite as nicely. So I have enough pens where it's worth it for me to get a second bulb syringe. I cut it and I put it over the outside of it like this when I clean it instead of doing it on the inside. And it works like magic. So, you know, I'm a big fan of the, the Metropolitan, the Safari, pretty much any of your starter pens, your newbie pens are gonna be great as getting second, third fountain pen. Um, usually what I like to recommend is rather than going up the price scale when you start to get into fountain pens, try and stay around near the entry level and try and get different nib sizes, try and get different colors and, and materials. You know, it's like the nice thing about something like a Lamy Safari and a Pilot Metropolitan. They're very reliable pens. They're very predictable. So pretty much the experience you hear about everybody talking about having them is gonna be pretty consistent across the board. Um, but this one you get to try, you know, uh, a thinner Japanese nib. It's gonna be a metal pen. You know, it's gonna feel a little bit different than your German, you know, with a plastic and all that kind of stuff. So you can get, you know, a fine nib on your Metropolitan, maybe try a, a medium or a broad or even a 1.1, you know, calligraphy nib stub or something like that on your Safari. And you can vary up your experience a little bit and you get to try it out and get to expand without investing a ton of money up the ladder. You get to try a bunch of kind of starter pens and then any of these can be used with something like a bulb syringe and have a really fun experience um, on your first maybe like five or eight pens or so. And then you can, you know, kind of 
uh, either hone down your collection, get rid of the ones that you don't use as much, give them away, whatever, sell them, uh, and then you can start investing higher once you have a little bit more knowledge of the things that you really, really like. So anyway, um, Twisby is another really good one that's good for disassembly. Um, so they actually come with instructions and a wrench for being able to take your pens apart. It's a little more involved. A lot of people who are new to fountain pens, um, you know, kind of bite off more than they can chew. They take it apart and they have a hard time getting it back together. It's not everybody, but we hear more about Twisby reassembly questions on our team than you would probably think. Um, so that is one thing. We got videos on that and how to put them back together and all that, but even still, some people it's just a little bit much. So if you're feeling adventurous, that's a really good one to do too. And when you disassemble the Twisbees, um, you know, when you can, when you have a piston filler or even a vacuum filler, and you can actually pull the whole assembly out of the back, well, you can still use a bulb syringe, even though it's a much bigger cavity in here. You can use a bulb syringe to flush it through just like you would a cartridge converter. And then you just reassemble the piston and you're good to go. So that's another example of why that's such a great tool. All right. Next question is from Nothing Extenuate on Instagram. <clears throat> I am wanting to make some fountain pen gift packs for friends. Do you have recommendations for the kind of things I should include? I want something a bit more reliable than a basic beginner pen, but I also don't want a pen that's high maintenance. Should I include ink samples and what other small things could I bulk the gift out with it seems too strange to include syringes um you know the syringes is probably if you're just gifting it it depends on how well you know them and how much you can explain what's going on this doesn't necessarily leave the greatest first impression of like yeah we're fountain pens and you know this is what we get into like uh it requires a little bit of explanation so if, if you're completely new to fountain pens and you don't know what this is it's for refilling ink cartridges. It's for making converters easier to fill. You can use it to um, you know, get the last bit of ink out of your ink bottle. You can use it for ink mixing and, and so on. So it, it's for that kind of stuff, but it's, it's more for some of the, like the, you know, not the, not the fountain pen 101, but maybe fountain pen 201 uh, kind of use of fountain pens. Very handy tool, but uh, confusing if you're receiving it at the onset, right? So um, you, what I always like to do when I'm thinking about somebody who's brand new to fountain pens. Um, there's kind of a trifecta of products that all interact with each other to provide a great writing experience. So you have your fountain pen, you have your ink, which I didn't, I didn't grab any ink on me. Look at this, I got some samples here handy, I think. Samples, right? So you got your pen, your ink, and then paper is the other thing. Paper is something that gets overlooked by pretty much everybody at the beginning, but it can really make such a huge difference for only a couple of bucks uh, in your writing experience. So, um, you know, that's something that I would urge you to consider in your in your kind of like starter pack. Um, I think ink samples are a great way to go, especially if you're trying assembling multiple packs. Um, you know, whether or not someone gets like super into it, if you're giving them like, you know, six or eight different samples that all have different colors in them, you need to instruct them like you have to clean the pen in between each color. That's one thing that's gonna be a judgment call on your part as to how willing whoever is receiving your gift is going to be to learn how to clean their pen like right away. Because you can get a couple of fills out of an ink sample, but it's not like you can use it for like six months without having to clean the pen. You're gonna to have to learn how to clean the pen pretty much at the get. Uh, and that's fine, we have videos on that kind of thing. You can link them up, you can teach them yourself. That's all great. Um, so you can do that, but you know, just be aware that if you're giving samples, you're pretty much forcing them to learn how to clean their pen in the first couple of weeks, which maybe isn't such a bad thing anyway. Uh, but you know, certainly you could go with an ink bottle as an alternative to inks or a couple ink bottles, depending on what your budget is. Um, I think that there's a good way. I would go with something that's not a permanent, not a shimmer, just something that's pretty tried and true. You know, Pilot or Shizuku is a great option. Um, you know, there's a bunch of Noodler's options that are not anything too crazy. The more the standard line that are economical. You know, there's lots of other options that are that are more in the affordable range. I'm a Robert Oster fan and, and you know, Die Mine and certainly ones like that. So um, Monteverde can be really good too. And actually we're, we're expanding more into the 30 mil Monteverdes as opposed to the 90 mils. So a lot of them are more affordable too. So, you know, for like $8 or so, you can get a smaller bottle um, that's gonna last. So if you know that somebody's really into a certain color, you could get those instead of a sample pack. But the nice thing about a sample pack is you can get them a variety of colors. Um, so that's totally up to you. Uh, and then the paper. So 
paper. I love the Rodeo number 16 dot pad. It's been a standby for me for years. Of course, you can go with a line, you can go with a lot of different options, but um, for me, the dot is really handy uh, and uh, it works really well because the lines aren't super prominent. So you have a lot of freedom to, to write however big or small that you really want. Um, the dots are five millimeters in between uh, and the paper is really fantastic quality. It's a great notepad for just kind of having out on the desk, especially as you're inking up pens and trying different colors and all that. It's nice to have something like that. So that's really good. Or um, I'm a fan of these, very biased because they're Goulet, but um, these are Tomoe River uh, notebooks that we have. So you can get them in different size configurations. So you have a couple options there. Um, but the paper quality is really great. It's a very thin, very portable notebook that could be handy to carry around uh, for somebody who's just getting into it. And all these are in like the five to seven, eight dollar range. So um, not a huge investment, nice to include in a package. You know, so depending on which pen you're including, you could do like, you know, a Jinhao shark pen for four bucks. Uh, two or three ink samples, you know, for five bucks total, and then, you know, a notebook. So like for under $15, you could get together a little basic trifecta set for the people that you know. Or if you want to go a little higher end, you can go with a Twisby Metropolitan Safari, somewhere in that range. And you could get, you know, maybe a bottle of ink and, night, you know, a couple notebooks or something like that be more in that $50 range, um, depending on, you know, what it is that you're going for. So maybe if somebody's just a work associate versus like a family member, you may, your budget may be a little bit different. Um, but you got a lot of different options there. So I think, you know, certainly any of the something like the fountain pens for newbies, you know, so you're talking Metropolitan's Diplomat Magnum is a really great one to go with. Um, you know, certainly any of the gin house would work. Um, Platinum Preppy, that could be good too. So a lot of these kind of starter pens can be really good as gift pens too. Something that's not too uh, crazy to do. Um, and then, you know, another handy tool, a bulb syringe is always handy for learning how to clean pens. That's an easy add-on to throw in. Other little things, a lot of the other things that we have, aside from the bulb syringe, are like kind of that next level, like getting into syringes, brass sheets, micro mesh, that kind of stuff. That's really... That's not something that you would just give to somebody that doesn't know anything about fountain pens, in my opinion. Maybe a pen flush, maybe, um, you know, if, if you need to. But if you're controlling what ink they get at the onset, you don't have to get them anything that's too hard to clean out that might require that. But um, it's good to kind of maybe just have that awareness of that or include that if you want to get into more of that $50 range pack. So there you go. All right. At BlightDM on Twitter asked cleaning pen questions rags versus paper towels i'd like to use less paper goods but what's a good rag to soak up excess ink um i'm not like a rag brand aficionado here nor do i even know if that matters per se um you know it's like i've been watching stephen brown's videos for years he definitely has a rag and it looks kind of cool because it's like covered in ink um, I really, I use my micro, math, micro no, my microfiber towels more for cl cleaning my pen off and, and uh, you know, buffing it out and stuff like that. Uh, I don't use, I don't know why, I just haven't really gone the route of using a rag for, you know, ink use. Uh, I use paper towels a little bit more. So I will, what I do is I buy paper towels that are like the, the select the size, the, the half sheet and I kind of fold them like this, I'll use them. I mean, I'll use one like this for like a week or two and then I'll toss it. So for me, it's like, I'm not, I'm not plowing through these enough to where I'm like, I have to use a rag. Um, but that's totally a personal choice and I don't judge one way or the other. Um, for me, I think a great option would be a, a microfiber cloth because they're gonna be pretty safe on your pens. Um, going with, uh, you know, something that's like a cotton or a terry cloth or something soft, something absorbable. Uh, is going to be probably more the way to go, uh, and then you can, you know, use that. Uh, you can use an old cotton t-shirt or something like that for sure. Um, you know, I don't know if any other type of towel would be ideal, but I think this would be, um, you know, pretty much anything soft is going to pretty much dead it for you. Uh, but I don't know that it particularly matters one way or another, as long as you're not using a, you know, something too, too crazy. I can't even think of an example of anything that would be highly inappropriate to use, um, but basically a soft cloth, you're gonna be uh, in pretty good shape. Uh, I wouldn't use like maybe a chamois cloth or something like that. That might get weird with ink. Um, but something that's gonna absorb the ink 
and then also be soft on your pen. I think you're gonna be in pretty good shape. Terry cloth, microfiber, old t-shirt. You're gonna be really safe going that route. Cool. Gary R on Facebook asks, I'm new to the fountain pen world. When reading comments on nibs, people talk about smoothness and feedback. The first I get, and I understand why people want smooth nibs, but what is feedback and why do some want it and others don't, okay? I think when you're talking about smoothness and feedback, it's really kind of two sides of the same coin. You're really describing the same thing, just in different, in different sides of it. Um, so for example, smoothness, you're generally referring to how smooth something is getting. So moving more smooth is the goal. And I think that's natural for fountain pens because fountain pens in general tend to be capable of a smoother writing experience than ballpoints, rollerballs, markers, pencils, all these types of things. Fountain pens, generally speaking, are able to provide you at their smoothest with a smoother writing experience than most other types of writing instruments out there. So, of course, what people are looking for, kind of a holy grail of smoothness, fountain pens are kind of the ultimate. Uh, and so that's something that's talked about a lot in the context of fountain pens. Now, not everybody, that's not everybody's motivation into using fountain pens. There's a lot of other reasons why people could use them. They think they look cool, their status, they like the artistry, they like the, the technology, they, they're fascinated by the designs of certain pens or the brands or whatever. There's a lot of different things that people could be into. They like to the color choices and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of different ways that you can go about it without smoothness being the goal. So some people, they really like the way that they're, you know, mechanical pencil feels. You know, some people like to have that, that drag or that what's called feedback. Basically feedback is how much, you know, how much you're feeling the nib drag on the page. So a lot of feedback is the opposite of smoothness. Now it gets a little fuzzy here because some people equate the opposite of smoothness as scratchy and certainly feedback taken to the extreme could be scratchy. That's when you're your nib you know, could have a burr on it or could be misaligned or something and is actually digging into the paper. That is, generally speaking, not a desirable trait with fountain pens, to say the least. Um, but that would be a very extreme example of feedback because you're very much feeling the pen dragging on the page. Now, no one wants scratchiness, basically. Uh, I don't know anyone who says, I want my nib to rip the paper apart when I'm writing with it. Mm. Not, not so much people's goals, um, but you know, somewhere in between there is, is feedback. And so a lot of times it's because people feel like a really smooth nib is just too slippery and, they, and their handwriting feels sloppy. They feel like they are, can't, don't have as much control when they write. Um, and so they want to have a little bit of grab on the page. You know, maybe, it's a, maybe it depends on writing speed. Maybe it depends on someone's particular handwriting style and how fluid it is versus how much they kind of jar back and forth. There's a lot of different reasons and probably if you ask 10 people, they're gonna have 10 different preferences and explanations as to why they like the particular amount of feedback that they do. Um, but even still, that's, that's where there's a whole spectrum of how smooth people like nibs and don't and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's, uh, it's interesting because, you know, there's a surprising amount of, of feeling that you have just in your fingertips. Um, it's way more, your fingertips are way more sensitive than I think most people realize. Uh, and so you, you actually have a very kind of, very kind of sensitive feel of texture um, when you're writing with a pen on paper more so than uh, you probably realize. But it is very difficult to kind of scientifically nail down just how much feedback something has. So you know, when you're trying to equate a feeling to a, a verbalization, you know, not getting too much into it, but it's basically different parts of your brain that equate uh, uh, your, your feelings. It's like your, your, what is it, your limbic, or your, shoot, this is where my science is breaking down, but something like the prefrontal cortex does your language and then the limbic system does um, your feelings and emotions. It's more of a basic kind of feeling. So anyway, I think that's right, but I'm not 100% sure. I've been reading books on this lately, um, not related to writing at all, um, more related to emotions and stuff. But anyway, so like how, how good something feels on the page um, isn't necessarily related to the language that we can use to describe it. So that's why you hear people describe it in all these different words and things is trying to uh, interpret it that way. But ultimately it boils down to how much does somebody like the feeling of just kind of slip sliding all over the page versus 
very specific feeling and control uh, of the nib on the page. So there you go. Hope that helps. All right, a uh, couple questions left. One is a troubleshooting question. This is from Matthew G on Facebook. What grit micro mesh should you use to safely begin and then finish the process of smoothing a nib? And is this the same for any nib of any material of any size? For example, extra fine to stub. Okay, so if you notice, if you go to gulaypens.com, you will see a 12,000 grit micro mesh. Boom, 12,000. Uh, and it is the only micro mesh that we sell. Uh, and that's for a reason because if you are trying to do smoothing, um, which I consider more of a kind of a final step, not the absolute final smoothest you can get it, but really if you're trying to get it from has too much feedback and I'm trying to make it smoother, the 12,000 grit micro mesh is pretty much the start and end of that. You can go more aggressive on your micro mesh. You can go to an 8,000 or a 6,000 or 4,000 or an 800 grit. Um, and you can get like buff sticks that have multiple different types of grits on them. We don't sell these. Um, I've debated about it over the years whether we should or not. We don't because honestly, when you get into anything more aggressive into a lower, a lower grit count, I don't know if you know anything about how grit works, but basically, um, and even with micro mesh, it's like 12,000 is it's kind of on its own little system. But basically, the higher the number, the the less um, particulate per square inch or whatever per whatever measurements is within that area. So for example, if you have regular like sandpaper for woodworking, if you have a 60 or an 80 grit, you know, there's gonna be like huge chunks of sand on there because that means there's only like 60 or 80 pieces of abrasive within that square inch. Whereas if you have a 400 or a 6,000, you're gonna have way smaller pieces of abrasive within the same area and it's going to feel smoother so it's for a finer polish so the higher the number the finer the polish so if you go with a more aggressive micro mesh or a more aggressive you know abrasive of some kind it's going to take off more material of your pen uh, or of your nib so if you go with something more aggressive than a 12,000 you're in my opinion and from talking to other nibmeisters and and stuff like that, um, you're really getting away from smoothing and you're getting into shaping. So if you're grinding a nib, there are intermediate um, steps that you will do because if you're grinding, you're really taking off huge chunks and it feels very, very textured. And so you'll go through stages of getting it smoother. So technically speaking, you can have rougher grits of micro mesh for smoothing, but really you're doing a lot of that to shape the nib. Um, it's the kind of the final step of the 12,000 that's really used in what I would consider to be a kind of uh, a user grade. If you're buying a brand new fountain pen for off the shelf and you want to smooth it, a 12,000 grit micro mesh is going to be about the only thing that would be smoother than what you would already be buying from a factory nib. Do you get what I'm saying? So if you go with something more aggressive, you're actually getting into making it less smooth than it would be coming from pretty much any of the manufacturers. Uh, you can go smoother than micro mesh with something like uh, mylar paper. You know, there's the green and then the white is the smoothest. Those get into one micron and 0.3 micron, which is very, very smooth. It doesn't even feel like abrasive. Um, you know, the micro mesh kind of feels like leather or like, sh yeah, kind of like leather, uh, like a very smooth leather. And then these, these basically just feel kind of like plastic. They don't even really feel like an abrasive. But on your very, very fine nib, um, it will act as an abrasive and make it really smooth um, if, you're, if you're messing around with the mylar. So uh, there you go. That answers that part of the question. And then the other part you had, does it matter for any particular nib size or material or anything like that? Well, basically, no matter what nib that you're tuning or smoothing, uh, you're kind of dealing with similar materials. I mean, obviously the nib itself, if it's a stainless steel nib versus a gold nib versus palladium or whatever, the nib, like the surface of the nib and the body of the nib itself is, is a different material, but the tipping is gonna be still some kind of iridium, rhodium, whatever alloy. Uh, and it's gonna be just fairly, it's just a fairly hard, uh, you know, kind of, kind of metal uh, that's actually harder than gold or stainless steel um, because it's gotta be very hard wearing, right? There are some nibs out there like a, a 
you know, a Lamy um, um, 1.1, or like the stub nibs. Most stainless steel stub nibs do not have tipping material on them. So then you're dealing directly with this, the steel. Um, there may be a little bit of consideration there because it's technically a little softer than the, the tipping material you would have on most other nibs. But uh, generally speaking, you can treat most fountain pen nibs similarly when you're smoothing them. Um, you don't ever want to smooth any of them past the point where they're already smooth. Because if you do it too, 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 too much, even with a fine abrasive like a MicroMesh uh, 12,000 grit, um, if you do it enough, you can actually reshape it or um, you know, make it so that it's uh, uh, not in its ideal um, smoothness or shape. Um, and then what's see here? Other the nib sizes, so extra fine, stub, etc. Uh, that's where you get into technique. It's not that the type of abrasive that you use it changes a at all, really. Um, you know, the techniques and stuff, if you're like grinding a stub from a regular, uh, nib, there are going to be different grits and stuff that you may use more than others or um, obviously just like the more surface area there is if there's a broad nib as opposed to a triple extra fine, your touch is going to be different and the amount of time that you spend honing and smoothing that nib is going to be different based on whether you have a very very fine nib or something with a glob of material on it like a stub. Um, so the technique will be different so the process there is a little different. but. Uh, largely, it's the, 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 what you're doing is the same, it's just more or less of it. And something like a stub, you know, if you're using a regular fountain pen and it's got just kind of a ball tip on the end of it, you know, when you're, when you're smoothing it, you don't just smooth it back and forth in one place. You kind of rotate it in your hand, you go up, you go down, you kind of smooth it all around because it's got a round ball on the end of it and you want it to stay kind of that rounded shape. Well, a stub is different. A stub, you know, comes up and then it's got rounded corners, but it's more or less kind of flat on the top and the sides. So you're not going to round it quite as much because you're going to need to polish it on those flat parts. And then you'll round it a little bit, but it's going to be shaped just a little bit differently. So there's a technique there that is a little bit different. Um, but the, the process, more or less overall, is going to be pretty similar. Um, so uh, Nibmeisters, when you see them, if you ever see them working at a show, or some people have like YouTube videos and stuff like that, it's kind of an essential basic kit that they'll use of abrasives when they're doing the nib work. And it's just, you know, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of practice for them to learn the specific techniques that may be very, very subtly different from one pen to another, from one nib to another. Um, but overall, the process is largely similar. All right, last question I have for this week is a business question from Meg S. on Facebook. Meg, you've asked some good questions here. What's been the most challenging thing about creating and running the Goulet Pen Company? Which I've answered before, but I, there she goes on, so I wanted to elaborate. Was it easier in the beginning when it was just you and Rachel out of your house, or is it easier now? Oh, yes. Okay, so most challenging thing, you know, I don't think there's any like one scenario. There's been, there's been a lot of things that have been quite challenging along the way. Um, I think I'm going to not go into one specific scenario because we've had, I mean, there's been some things that have been a mixture of challenging and a mixture of not challenging because we just didn't have a choice. Uh, and so it's actually very easy to make, like, you know, when Rachel was debating about going back to work versus working in the business full time, it was challenging for like two seconds because it was like, oh my gosh, can we really make this business work? And then it was immediately super easy because it was like, yeah, we're just going to go all in and make this thing happen, which was super easy. So there's stuff like that where it's like hard to say how that was challenging or not. But I think in general, there's a theme that's happened over the last nine or 10 years as we've been doing this. Um, that I can speak to that really kind of transcends any one specific period of time. And you can probably relate to this if you've ever, certainly if you've ever had your own business or worked in a small business or a very entrepreneurial environment, um, you can probably recognize this and have felt this yourself. Um, or maybe just even in your own, you know, if you've been promoted or gone into management or made any type of major change, you can probably relate. Uh, or, I'm trying to make this apply to everybody, or if you've ever uh, become a parent. I think that's, that's, you know, I've had that experience so I can relate to that very well. Um, I call it the imposter syndrome. So basically, if you feel like you've been put into a situation where maybe you weren't prepared for it or 
it just kind of happened. Like with us, we got into the business, it grew, we had to hire people, we expanded, we had to hire leadership and raise up leaders within our business and take on new, you know, initiatives. Certainly we felt, you know, we were young and experienced, never dreamed that the business would be where it is now, let alone where it was seven years ago. Uh, and there are certainly have been kind of just a series of opportunities and, and things that have happened, or not opportunities, but a series of times in this business uh, that happen on a very regular basis. Uh, every time we're trying something new and pushing ourselves um, that says, kind of in the back of our mind, like, are you really qualified to do this? Are you really? <laughs> Do you really think that you can make this happen? Because uh, you've never done this, you've never known anyone to do this, you read it in a book maybe, and now you're gonna actually try it. So there's this like little voice in the back of our heads that is kind of always there with that little question. Now, most people I think uh, would either have that little voice and say, yeah, I really am not qualified. I really, you know, who am I to lead leaders within our company? Who am I to hire somebody with 20 years more experience than me to run an operation in our company when I don't even feel like I'm doing it well? How am I gonna be able to lead it? You know, running into those types of scenarios or, or if anyone's like not doing particularly great and you have to discipline them or possibly, you know, look to, help them on their way at another company. It's like, who am I to say that? So there's all kinds of opportunities that have happened over the 10 years where there's that little, that little, that little thing in the, in the back of your head. Um, and, it, and it's kind of always there. It's never like, I'm fearless and I can take on anything. It's like, no, like bravery is not about never being afraid or never having doubts. It's about not being crippled by those fears or those doubts. So, uh, you know, certainly there are absolutely terrifying prospects of things that Rachel and I deal with on a regular basis. Um, and it's at the point now where it's like, uh, pretty much at any given time, uh, I can say we are operating at a position where we don't know exactly how we're going to solve the things that are coming on our way. At least once a day, there's something where I'm just like, Oh my gosh, what the heck am I gonna do here? You know, and I have to kind of think through it and talk to my team and read up on it and study it. And you know, that's just what it's like to be growing, to be learning, you know, and just like if you've ever, even if you haven't run your own company, if you've ever stepped up into a position or gotten hired for a new job or gotten promoted or anything, you know, parenting is a great example because it's like, you know, <laughs> There is no, there is nothing like getting into some getting thrown into something without really realizing what you got into like having a kid um, you know for sure and we did both at the same time we started our business and had our first kid right at the same time um, so we really yeah that was pretty tough uh, in that first year there for sure so I mean reflecting back to where we were in the earliest days of the business we were 25 had a new mortgage a baby this business we were not drawing any paycheck from ourselves had no savings no investments of anything uh, we were really living on a shoestring at that time just a hope and a prayer and a ton of hard work to get the business off the ground in the in the in the garage days as we affectionately call them um, and there was an element of that being very difficult uh, for sure but at the same time, there was almost an elegant simplicity to all of that because it was just me and Rachel. We were extremely unified. We were had a very clear goal in mind, and everything that we did, it was directly, you know, we could see the impacts of the work that we were doing, and when it succeeded, we could celebrate in that, and when it failed, we could learn from that and apply it and fix it immediately. Uh, as we grew, you know, just like having kids, when you have that first year where it's, it's a new baby and you have no idea which, I'm not, I, I personally had never changed a diaper before we had our first kid. So I'm like in the hospital. I mean, we had like went to a, you know, a nursery class or whatever, but I've, I'd never changed a diaper on a living baby before our son was born. And it was like, all right, let's do it. And you change a lot of diapers at the beginning, uh, like 20 a day, like no joke, easily. Um, so yeah, you get used to it pretty quick. <laughs> So it was the kind of thing where it was like, okay, here I am, I'm doing this. And it's like, you're there, you have to be constantly there. You can't even like take a shower, 
you know, unless somebody else is watching the kids. So it's like everything in your life has to be coordinated and intentional. And it's very physically draining because you have to be responsible for more than just yourself. And then it's the same kind of thing with the business. When the business is really young, you know, every phone call, every email, every website issue, every HR thing, everything is, is you got to take care of it, you know. As we got older, as the business aged, we hired more people, as our kids have gotten older, it's honestly, it's been amazing to see how much in sync and how much of a perfect metaphor raising a kid and raising a business has been uh, in, in that, you know, as you get more people on your team, they're more responsible, they're doing things, they're kind of out there representing you, your brand, your baby, uh, but you're not directly doing it. You still check in, you're responsible, you're accountable, you train them, you coach them, you care for them, uh, and, and you have to provide for them uh, in, in that role. But it's, it's really similar with a kid. You know, a kid goes off to school and you hope you've taught them well, but they're out there living in the world, doing their thing, they have your name, they're representing you in a way, but they also represent themselves. And so it's like, it's kind of a similar correlation between the two. So it's like, but at the same time, you're not like having to be there every 30 seconds, every hour, uh, you know, taking care of every single one of your kids' needs as they become five, seven, nine, et cetera. Um, and that's where my kids are now, they're seven and nine. It's the same kind of thing. Like they're off at school, they're doing things, they're taking tests, they're learning things in school where I'm like, I don't remember that at all. You're like on your own. Like <laughs> I can help my kids with some of their homework. But a lot of it, I'm just like, well, I'll show you the approach of how I try to learn homework. But uh, yeah, you're gonna have to figure this out on your own, buddy. Uh, so <laughs> some of that is, uh, is just reality there. Um, and it's kind of the same thing here at work, like people have solutions and I'm like, well, you, you tell me, or people have problems, I'm like, you tell me what you think the solution is here. I'm not in that exact scenario, I wasn't there, I didn't hear that conversation. I'll guide and mentor you, but I can't, I can't solve this for you. You know, so it's like, it becomes different. It becomes less of like a physical intense, I'm there every minute, like it was in the garage days. And it's more of a mental game at this point, you know? I'm having meetings and I'm, I'm trying to structure the organization and meeting rhythms and stuff like that that I think is gonna improve communication, but you know, I have to constantly check in and see and get feedback and people have feelings and, you know, all this kind of stuff and opinions and all that. And it all kind of gets mashed together in my head. And then I have to try to make decisions that I think will provide clarity and direction and inspiration for everybody. So it becomes way more mental, less physical. You know, the first year we were running business, I was making videos, I was packing orders, I was, you know, doing inventory, I was doing all that kind of stuff, writing emails. Now I'm doing very little of any of that. Well, I'm making a video right now, but you know what I mean? <laughs> Not editing it. Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, it gets, it's, it's different. You know, some things are harder, some things are easier. It's just different. So um, I think part of it is just like with parenting, it's like you have to appreciate the stage where you are and you have to enjoy and have perspective on what's going on. You can always look and say, oh man, this is so hard. I can't wait until this happens, or it'll be so much easier when, or if only I could get through this, then I can blah. It never really ends. It just shifts and is kind of different and there's lots of things to appreciate at every single stage. And it's definitely that way with children, it's definitely that way with a business, and it's definitely that way as you grow, you gotta let some things go and you gotta take on new things and new responsibilities and that is just the process. So um, yeah, it's really interesting, really fascinating. Um, but that's how I would summarize it. My question of the week for you this week as we finish up is what ink color do you have in your collection that you don't use, but not really for any good reason? Just what are you like overlooking? Not like I used it and I hate this color or whatever. That's pretty obvious. But you know, assuming you have like multiple colors, if you're like, yeah, I like this color, but I just, I never grab it when I go to fill up my pen. I'm curious to know what color that is for you. If it's a range of colors or like a specific ink brand color, that's cool too, but I'd love to hear what, uh, what that is for you. Uh, be sure to check out GouletPens.com for a lot of the products I've talked about here. Uh, and uh, I should be back to doing Q and A's on a pretty regular basis now because I'm through my gauntlet of spring traveling. I should be staying put now for a little bit. Uh, so I'm excited about that, get the family life you know, nice and stabilized, it should be pretty good. So appreciate you spending time with me here on this Q&A. It's my absolute pleasure to be doing this with you. Thanks so much for watching and right on.